Cool, easily missable little thing in this first shot. You can actually see Iro here. He's just camouflaged in pretty good as all. Well. It's a new day. We've got a new apartment, new furniture, and today's the grand opening of your new tea shop. Things are looking up, Uncle. This change can seem kind of drastic, even to the most open of minds. It's clear Zuko really went through some shit to come out the other side feeling like this, but having the things that really cemented these feelings for Zuko being dreams kind of rings hollow, I think. This is supposed to be Zuko's big breaking point, kind of, we'll get to that. But seeing it be so drastic so suddenly feels jarring. It kind of plays to the opposite effect of all those reality checks he's gotten up until now that slowly changed him. Of course, this only lasts for about an episode and a half, so I probably shouldn't have written an entire paragraph about this, but here we are at the end of the paragraph. <laughs> Sokka, good to see you. Really quick in this one shot, you can see this guy compare his own height to Sokka, since these guys haven't seen him since he was just a little kid. Wait, if you look super closely here, you can see some unknown water tribesmen we'll never see again. He's not important, I promise. Never again. He doesn't even have a name. I guarantee it. Fuck! Bato's arm is all jacked up here, and if you remember, he was actually being treated for it back in his titular episode. Hi, Dad. Man, there's so much good feeling Sokka stuff in this episode. I love this shit. Look, Bosco. The Kyoshi warriors are here to protect us. He said, famously, and wrong. It's terrible when you can't trust the people who are closest to you. Slick little bit of foreshadowing with this glance between May and Tai Li, knowing that they betray Azula in the not-so-distant future. The Council of Five is meeting to plan an invasion of the Fire Nation this summer, on the day of a solar eclipse. For some reason, I love the fact that Azula's eyes widen a little bit, but we don't see her eyebrows shoot up. It's like she's surprised, but she's so cold and sick with it that it's only the tiniest bit of that surprise would ever show. Way less than an average person. I think that's really cool. Also, you'll notice that Azula actually took specifically Suki's headgear. She's the leader, so I guess she gets the leader's outfit. Even more badger mole statues. Cool. General Fong's base will serve as the launching point for the attack. General Fong gets name dropped here, who is the same general that we saw in the first episode of this season, who was all fired up about the Avatar state. Similarly, we can see General Sung here, the general from the top of the wall in the drill episode. The army and navy will invade the Fire Nation on the day of Black Sun. Or we could send in Momo to do some damage. There's a timeline where Momo ate the fish and this war was over months ago using this exact tactic, I'm telling you. All we need is the Earth King's seal in order to execute the plan. All right, man, you can just hand it to me. Come on. Guru Patik is seen meditating on the same platform he was in Abba's Lost Days here. I was a spiritual brother of your people and a personal friend of Monk Yatsu. Holy moly, forget the air temple. This dude's body is a temple. He's what, minimum 110 years old then? If they were like colleagues, he's probably at least 160, 170. If your body weight in pounds is ever lower than your age, I think that's a pretty enormous accomplishment. Ugh, it tastes like onion and banana juice. That's because it is. Wait, drinking onion and banana juice? That's a good Patreon goal. Someone someone write that down. You might think you're the greatest earthbender in the world, but even you can't bend metal. Literally every time I watch this scene and I see Toph quizzically touch the metal, I think of the words, can I fucking not in my head as if she's thinking them. I don't know why. It's permanently in my head to do that. We have been presented with an extraordinary opportunity, girls. Oh, look at the reflection attention to detail on Azula walking through the room. That's super cool. I don't think I've ever noticed that one until right now. May finally gets to wear makeup that's not totally depressing? Ha ha. The writers are so good, man. Like, yeah, that's totally a little lighthearted jab a teenager would make at their friend. Like, this feels so natural. I love how they characterize these people. I'm talking about conquering the whole Earth Kingdom. Oh, word? There's things that people like about Azula. Oh, she's so powerful. She's got cool blue fire. She is that one cool one-liner. But this is the kind of shit that speaks to me when I'm watching a villain. The Earth King just delivered a bombshell to her that her home is going to be invaded in a few months. But that's still not her immediate concern. The Dai Li is mentioned to her in the same conversation, kind of offhandedly, and she didn't lose that info in the shock of finding out about the invasion. That's really cool, like she easily could have tunnel visioned on that, but she stayed the course and found a way to take the offensive. That's what makes her a great villain to me, her cunning and mental fortitude and stability. In order to master the Avatar's day- Hey! What's that? That better not be what I think it is. I guess we'll start with the basics. The water flows through this creek 
much like the energy flows through your body. This is an awesome way to simplify and represent the idea of chakras. So much so that one time I was at this new agey kind of presentation about Eastern philosophies and the presenter literally used the creek with pools of water analogy. And I was like, whoa, 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 hold on. In that moment, I was that Leonardo DiCaprio meme. There are seven chakras that go up the body. Each pool of energy has a purpose and can be blocked by a specific kind of emotional muck. This is true in the real life way of thinking too, but what's really cool is that there's a color that represents each chakra as well. During all of Aang's chakra unlocking exercises, we see visions that he's experiencing that are tinted with the color that that specific chakra is associated with. Like for example, this first one is the red chakra, so Aang's visions are in red. The final chakra is purple, so Aang's visions are in purple, and so on and so on. It deals with survival and is blocked by fear. It's interesting that the first thing Aang thinks of is the blue spirit, who he knows is Zuko. Is Aang really afraid of Zuko? He's kind of clowned on him just about every time they've met. It could be that Zuko is just a representation of what the Fire Nation is in his head, and that's why he thinks of him. I've always really liked the concept of Aang being kind of afraid of the Avatar state and what it's capable of when he's not in control, and I'm really glad to see it's referenced again here. <laughs> I think we kind of need this moment of Aang being afraid of Ozai. Like, they're the destined final battle, but they only share the scenes of the final battle in the final two episodes. So I think it's really important to at least tell the audience how Aang feels about him. Next is the water chakra. Brilliant. Maybe one day you will be a guru too. You'll notice that this is the only chakra that Patik doesn't associate a body part to. Uh, that's because this chakra is associated with the genitals, so that was probably no bueno for a Nickelodeon show. This chakra deals with pleasure and is blocked by guilt. I really like that there's one chakra that deals with shame and one that deals with guilt. They're very much linked, but deal with very different events. Shame is kind of internal negative feelings about what you've done. You're disappointed in yourself. Guilt is when you perceive others thinking badly of you over something you've done. And I think that's a really cool and nuanced distinction to make. those people. This episode really opens up a lot of Aang to us too. We never see him really struggle with hurting those people, but you don't really see the things that bother people in the back of their minds, unless they open up, so I think this works really well. If you are to be a positive influence on the world, you need to forgive yourself. Bars, guru! I like that shit! When a ship detonates the mine, the seaweed tangles up the propeller and the foul smell forces people to abandon the ship. That's a very family-friendly mind you've come up there with, Hakoda. I'm sure Nickelodeon is very happy they don't blow up and kill people. The rest of you men, prepare for battle. Uh, what should I do, Dad? Aren't you listening? I said the rest of you men get ready for battle. Holy fuck, this feels good. Like, this might be one of my favorite moments in the whole show. Sokka finally gets the validation that his dad couldn't give him a few years ago. And it's written and delivered so perfectly. You could just tell how much it means to Sokka. I love this shit, man. No, I'm thankful because you decided to share this special day with me. It means more than you know. Man, they're doing a really good job of setting up the heart-wrenching finale between this and the Sokka stuff, just so they can do this. Strike to claim it, a strike to claim it, and he got it! Who do you think you are? I am! I'm never gonna firebend again. I can't. You will never find balance if you deny this part of your life. I like that Aang is trying to find balance within himself, and he's kind of a metaphor for the world at large at this point. He is air, water, and earth working together, but fire is the problem. The fire nation for the world, and fire bending for him. Each time Aang opens a chakra, we get this nice bell noise. But this time we kind of get a hollow sounding one, which plays into this joke. That chakra opened less like a flowing creek, and more like a... Burping bison. <laughs> oh hey, they replaced those badger mole statues. Very critical information, I know. You can you can thank me in the comments. The fourth chakra is located in the heart. It deals with love and is blocked by grief. Here we get a statue of what looks like Avatar Yang Chen, and there's a couple of them throughout the episode. Damn, Ang doesn't even think about his airbending friends, like the kids his age? That's cold. Very good. Can I have some onion banana juice, please? Man, how did he do that? That was like the perfect line read. Shout out to Zach Eisen, the voice actor for Aang. Absolutely killed it. This statue of Yang Chen seems to be wearing the same or a similar medallion to Gyatso in this statue. Aang said Gyatso was the best in the world, so could this be the best airbender in the world medallion? You must accept that you are the Avatar.
Pretty obvious, but this is the same shot from the opening. Don't think anyone missed that one. Very good, Ang. I know people don't like how quickly Aang seems to get through this entire very daunting spiritual journey in probably about 10 minutes of screen time, but I think it's fine. More than fine. I think this is paced really well and stays very interesting throughout. I don't need another episode for this. The greatest illusion of this world is the illusion of separation. Like the Four Nations. Yes. We are all one people. But we live as if divided. Of course this episode has banging lessons throughout that the viewer can follow along with. This one obviously about the stupidity of xenophobia. But there are so many that you can get something out of. Forgive yourself. Face your fears. Accept who you are. I love everything about this. Even metal is just a part of Earth that has been purified and refined. Man, this is so cool, dude. The show is paced so amazingly. The viewer naturally has questions of the limits of bending. Well, why can't earthbenders bend metal? Couldn't waterbenders bend people? And it's so cool that they get around to answering those questions. And the answers are always interesting. Toph is literally the first to do it in history, and that feels awesome. This moment is either extremely gratifying because you've thought of metal bending yourself already and you're happy to see it, or you never thought of it and it blows your mind out the back of your head. This is just an incredible moment. Table for two, please. You want a chair for the lemur? Yeah, I want a chair for the lemur, obviously. What are you, an imbecile? Uncle, I need two jasmine, one green, and one lychee. I'm brewing as fast as I can. Oh, that ain't good. Meditate on what attaches you to this world. I get the fact that he likes Katara, and that's the whole crux of this conflict, and that's kind of how it has to work, but like, what about Appa, at least? Let them flow down the river, forgotten. What? Why would I let go of Katara? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Aang. The rest of the chakras have been things that everyone can kind of grasp and understand. But now that we're getting into this cosmic energy shit, the viewer loses the script, just like Aang does. And that's a pretty cool effect, that you've gone on this journey with him, and you come to the exact same conclusion as he does in this moment. <laughs> Thank goodness you're here, Suki. Something terrible is going on. Were you guys just sitting here in the throne room, waiting, menacingly? I just saw Prince Zuko and his uncle. She did the eye thing again. Ah! It's supposed to be blood. I get it. I got it. It's so fucking cool! This is like the coolest imagery ever! I don't even have a good answer for what this is. It's like the incarnation of the Avatar spirit, or like his potential or something. I don't care, this is like a top five moment in the show for me. I get chills whenever I watch this. Oh! Let me go! It's a nice touch that Katara is literally yelling to let her go in Aang's spiritual experience about letting her go. And he still can't bring himself to do it. For obvious reasons, but it's still a nice touch. It's another one of her tricks! There's a giant hole in the box. How is that a trick? It's not. It's the real deal. Oh my god, this episode is good. I don't even have anything to say here. This episode is just wicked. I'm going to be stuck in here forever with you, aren't I? All four walls around these two seem pretty flat and well intact, not like the scrunched up metal it should be after Toph just did that. Ready to go knock some Fire Nation heads? Hakoda says a very similar line to one Katara said in episode two here. And Sokka, I'm sure you'll get to knock some Firebender heads on the way. You don't know how much this means to me, Dad. I'll make you proud. Hey, check it out. Sokka gets a new club, and he even has it in a couple future episodes. This can't be good news. Man, this feels good. This plays off the very lesson that Hakoda imparted to Sokka way back when. Being a man is knowing where you're needed the most. And Sokka knows he needs to go with Aang right now, despite wanting to go with his father. Hell yeah, Hakoda turns around with a proud smile on his face. Why should I help you? Because I can get you the Avatar. Can you? The whole play is to use Katara as bait for Aang, right? That's really the only thing that happens in regards to capturing Aang. But Azula and company were the ones that caught Katara, so she doesn't need any help with that. The Darley helped capture Zuko, but that's pretty unrelated. Long Feng makes this promise, but I don't think he does anything at all to help capture Aang, other than give Azula command of the Daili, if you want to count that. This episode is unreal, one of my favorites. So many awesome moments. Hakoda and Sokka is the most feel-good shit in the world, Toph invents metal bending, and Aang's spiritual journey, while quick, is endlessly enthralling. Every time you cut to an 
new scene, you want to see what's happening. Every storyline is red hot. There's not a single second wasted. I love this episode. Patron shoutouts. If you want to be two episodes ahead of the YouTube releases, you can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Towering shoutouts go to my top patrons, Andrew Edwards, who is the man of your dreams, and mostly just the good ones, too. Charlie Rock Quigley, the man who discovered fashion and has been defining it ever since. Chase Brignac, who I once saw get a date because someone saw him from two miles away. Fetch Me Something Gay, who is the definition of Zemlich Cool, which is German for pretty cool. Fritz Sullivan, who I saw shoot a fly out of the air by spitting a grain of rice at it. Kennedy Stapleton, who was always there for you. Always. Right around the corner. Literally. Just out of sight. Lou Carrera, a man who was classically identified as two of the seven wonders of the world. Max Lewandowski, who was originally named Dave, but willed the entire universe to call him Max. Mike the Wizard, a guy who looks like a genetically engineered super person, but nah, it just worked out that way. Sad Wallet Noises, who can go from talking to someone in a bar to waking up in their bed in 15 minutes flat. He can run and fall asleep very quickly. Skylos, who got the words never change signed in his yearbook, but then he did just to stunt on them. Tommy, aka Underfoot, who can fry an egg by just dancing around it. His moves are that hot. Wolfman Dan, who missed a flight we were both supposed to get on, but mysteriously arrived on the other side of the planet before me using unknown means. You freaking nerd who can do things with their tongue you wouldn't believe. Thankfully, they use it for good, not evil. And Zoompy, who has mastered the art of looking like he's not trying while not trying and making it look good as hell. Other huge shoutouts go to my other top patrons, Aiden Aguirre, Alex Fritz, Be My Valentine, Bingo Dingo, Cabbage Gal, Canine Corpse, Kevin Yage, Code Canuck, Derek Cornwell, DJ Jax, Do Mutual A, Dr. Uwu, Distant, Earth 2 John, Eleanor Rose, Exmire, Glintlock, Jeremy Rubenstein, John Ajaka, Lehman Russ, Martin J1210. <laughs> Mitchell Gobrek, Mortius 007, Nicholas Abbott, Knock, Pegger Gas, Rumby B, Skyler JB, Steinwan, Steven Smart, The Most Super of Snippers, The Rainy Man on Heelys, Tiago Nascimento, Triad Juice, and William Stringer. Oh, I can't do that shit in one take anymore. It's not even close. Next up is The Crossroads of Destiny. Can't believe we're already here.